Good evening, lovely people. We are going to read I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, part four, um, by Maya Angelou. And um, I hope to be reading earlier than this. I'm tired, y'all, but I got to get myself into the routine so I can finish the book day after day. Yesterday, uh, Sister Monroe was acting out in church hollering all around and knocking the preacher down and um, that's where we are right now okay so the preacher has fallen to the ground because sister has caught the spirit and knocked him down with her all right the minister took advantage of already being on the floor and asked in a choky little voice if the church would kneel with him and offer prayer of thanksgiving he said we had been visited with the mighty spirit and let the whole church say, Amen. On the next Sunday, he took his text from the 18th chapter of the gospel according to St. Luke and talked quietly but seriously about the Pharisees who prayed in the streets so that the public would be impressed with their religious devotion. I doubted that anyone got the message, certainly not those whom it was directed. The deacon board, however, did appropriate funds for him to buy a new suit. The other one was a total loss. Our presiding elder had heard the story of Reverend Taylor and Sister Monroe, but I was sure he didn't know her by sight. My interest in the service's potential and my aversion to Reverend Thomas caused me to turn him off. Turning off or tuning out people was my highly developed art. The custom of letting obedient children be seen but not heard was so agreeable to me that I went on one step further. Obedient children should not see or hear if they chose not to do so. I laid a handful of attention on my face and turned up the sounds of the church. Sister Moreau's fuse was already lit. She sizzled somewhere to the right behind me. Elder Thomas jumped into the sermon, determined, I suppose, to give the members what they came for. I saw the ushers from the left side of the church near the big windows begin to move discreetly, like pallbearers toward Sister Monroe's bench. Bailey jogged my knee. When the incident with Sister Monroe, when the incident with Sister Monroe, which we always called simply the incident, had taken place, we had been too astounded to laugh, but for weeks after, all we needed to do was send our, to send ourselves into outbursts of laughter was whisper, Preach it! Anyway, he pushed my knee, covered his mouth, and whispered, Preach it, I say! Preach it! I looked toward Mama. Across the, that square of stained boards over the collection table, hoping that a look from her would root me safely to back to my sanity. But for the first time in memory, Mama was staring behind me at Sister Monroe. I suppose that she was counting on bringing that emotional lady up short with a severe look or two. But Sister Monroe's voice had already reached the danger point. Preach it! Preach it! There were few smothered giggles from the children's section, and Bailey nudged me again. I say preach it! He whispered. Sister Monroe echoed him loudly. I said, Bridget! Two deacons wedged themselves around Brother Jackson as a preventative measure, and two large, determined-looking men walked down the aisle towards Sister Monroe. While the sounds in the church were increasing, Elder Thomas made the regrettable mistake of increasing his volume, too. Then suddenly, like a summer rain, Sister Monroe broke into a cloud of people, trying to hem oh i'm sorry sister monroe broke through the cloud of people trying to hem her in and flooded up to the pulpit she didn't stop this time but continued immediately to the altar bound for elder thomas crying bridget i saw bridget bailey let out a loud hot dog and damn and she gonna beat his butt Shh. but reverend thomas didn't intend to wait for that eventuality so as Sister Monroe approached the pulpit from the right, he started descending from the left. And he was 
he was not intimidated by this change of venue. He continued preaching and just moving. He finally stopped right in front of the collection table, which put him almost in our laps. And Sister Monroe rounded the altar on her heels, or on his heels, followed by the deacons, ushers, and unofficial members of a few of the bigger children. Just as the elder opened his mouth, pink tongue waving and said, Great God of Mount Nebo, Sister Monroe hit him in the back of his head with her purse twice before he could bring his lips together. His teeth fell. No, actually, his teeth jumped out of his mouth. The grinning uppers and lowers lay right there by my foot, looking empty at the same time appearing to contain all the emptiness in the world. I could have stretched my foot out and kicked them underneath the bench or behind the collection table. Hmm. Sister Monroe was struggling with his coat, and the men had all but picked her up to remove her from the building. Bailey pinched me and said without moving his lips, I'd like to see him eat dinner now. I looked at Reverend Thomas desperately. If he had appeared just a little sad or embarrassed, I could feel sorry for him and I wouldn't be able to laugh. My sympathy for him would keep me from laughing. I dreaded laughing in church. If I lost control, two things were certain to happen. I would surely pee and just as surely I would get a whooping. And this time I would probably die because everything was funny. Sister Monroe and Mama trying to keep her quiet with those threatening looks and Bailey whispering, preach it. And Elder Thomas with his lips flapping loose like tired elastic and his teeth on the floor. But Reverend Thomas shrugged off Sister Monroe's weakening clutch, pulled out an extra large white handkerchief and spread it over his nasty little teeth. Putting them in his pocket, he gummed, naked I came unto the world and naked I shall go out. Bailey's laugh had worked its way up through his body and was escaping through his nose in short horse snorts. <coughs> I didn't try any longer to hold my laugh. I just opened my mouth and released the sound. Aha! Aha! I heard the first titter jump in over my head and over the pulpit and out the window. Aha! Mama said out loud, sister, but the bench was greasy and I slid off laughing onto the floor. There was more laughter in me to get out. I didn't know there was so much laughter in the whole world. It pressed at all of my body openings, forcing everything in its path. I cried and hollered, passed gas and urine. I didn't see Bailey descend onto the floor, but I rolled over laughing once and he was kicking and screaming it there too. Each time we looked at each other, we howled and howled, laughing louder and louder than before. And though he had tried to say something, the laughter attacked him, and he was only able to get out. I said, preach it out. <laughs> And then I rolled over into Uncle Willie's rubber-tipped cane. My eyes followed the cane up to his good brown hand on the curve of it and up the long white sleeve to his face. The one side pulled down as it usually did when he cried. It also pulled down when he laughed. He stood it. I'm going I'm going I'm going to whip you whip you this time myself. I have no memory of how we got out of the church and into the parsonage next door, but in that overstuffed parlor, Bailey and I received the whooping of our lives. I tried to, but Bailey refused to cooperate. I'm sorry. The whooping of our lives. Uncle Willie ordered us between licks to stop crying. Stop, to stop crying. I tried to, but Bailey refused to cooperate. Later, he explained to me that when a person is beating you, you're supposed to scream as loud as possible. Maybe the whipper will become embarrassed or else some sympathetic soul might come to your rescue. Our Savior came for neither of these reasons, but because Bailey yelled so loud, it disturbed what was left of the service. And the minister's wife came out and asked, Uncle Willie, can you quiet them down? Laughter so easily turns to hysteria for imaginative children. I felt for weeks after that that I had been very, very sick. And until I completely recovered my strength, I stood on laughter's cliff. And any funny thing could hurl me off to my death far below.
each time Bailey said, Bridget, to me, I hit him as hard as I could, and I cried. Chapter 7. Mama had married three times. Mr. Johnson, my grandfather, who left her around the turn of the century with two small sons to raise. Mr. Henderson, of whom I know nothing at all. Mama never answered questions directly put to her on any subject except for religion. Then finally, Mr. Murphy. I saw him a fleeting once. He came through stamps on a Saturday night, and Grandmother gave me the chore of making him a pallet on the floor. He was a stocky, dark man who wore a snap brim hat like George Raft. The next morning, he hung around the store until we returned from church. That marked the first Sunday I knew Mr. Uncle Willie to miss services. Bailey said he stayed home to keep Mr. Murphy from stealing us blind. He left in the middle of the afternoon one of Mama's, um, after one of Mama's extensive Sunday dinners. His hat was pushed back off his forehead. He walked down the road whistling. I watched his thick back until he turned the bend in the road by the big white church. People spoke of Mama as a good-looking woman, and some, who remembered her youth, said she used to be downright pretty. I saw only her power and her strength. She was taller than any woman in my personal world, and her hands were so large that they could span my head from ear to ear. Her voice was soft only because she chose to keep it so. In church, when she was called upon to sing, she seemed to pull out plugs from behind her jaws, and the huge, almost rough sound would pour over the listeners and throb in the air. Each Sunday, after she had taken her seat, the minister would announce, We will now be led in a hymn by Sister Henderson. And each Sunday, she would look up with amazement at the preacher and ask silently, Me? After a second of assuring herself that she indeed was being called upon, she laid down her handbag and slowly folded her handkerchief. This was placed neatly on top of the purse, and then she leaned on the bench in front of her and pulled herself up to standing. And then she opened her mouth, and the song jumped out as if it had already been waiting for the right time to make an appearance. Week after week and year after year, the performances never change, yet I don't remember anyone's ever remarking on her sincerity or readiness to sing. Mama intended to teach Bailey and me to use the paths of our life. Mama intended to teach Bailey and me to use the paths of life that she and her generation and all the Negroes who had gone before and found it and found to be the safe ones. She didn't cotton to the idea that white folks could be talked to at all without risking one's life. And certainly they couldn't be spoken to innocently. In fact, even in their absence, they cannot be spoken of too harshly in test unless we use the, the sobriquet they. If she had been asked and had chosen to answer the question of whether she was cowardly or not, she would have said that she was a realist. Didn't she stand up to them year after year? Wasn't she the only Negro woman in stamps who, refer who was once referred to as Mrs. by white folks? That incident became one of Stamp's little legends. Some years before Bailey and I arrived in town, a man was hunted down for assaulting a white woman. In trying to escape, he ran to the store, and Mama and Uncle Willie hid him behind the shipper robe until late night, gave him supplies for an overland journey, and sent him on his way. He was, however, apprehended in court when he was questioned as to his movements on the day of the crime. He replied that after he heard that he was being sought after, he took revenge in Mrs. Henderson's door. The judge asked that Mrs. Henderson be subpoenaed. And when Mama arrived and she said that she was Mrs. Henderson, the judge and the bailiff and the other whites in the audience <laughs> laughed. The judge had really made a goth calling a Negro woman Mrs. But then... He was from Pine Bluff and couldn't have been expected to know that a woman who owned a store in that village would also turn out to be colored. The whites tickled their funny bones with the incident for a long time, and the Negroes thought it proved the worth and majesty of my grandmother. Chapter 8 Stamps, Arkansas was Chitlin Switch. 
Georgia hang them high, Alabama don't let the sun set on you here, Migger, Mississippi, or any other name just as descriptive. People in stamps used to say that whites in our town were so prejudiced that a Negro couldn't buy vanilla ice cream, except on the 4th of July. Other days, he had to be satisfied with eating chocolate. A light shade had been pulled down between the black community and all things white, but one could see through it enough to develop a fear, admiration, contempt for the white things and white folks, cars and white glistening houses and their children and their women. But above all, their wealth that allowed them to waste was the most enviable. They had so many clothes that they were able to give perfectly good dresses worn just under their arms to the sewing class at our school for the larger girls to practice on. Although there was always generosity in the Negro neighborhood, it was indulged on the pain of sacrifice. Whatever was given by black people to other blacks was probably needed as desperately by the donor as by the receiver, a fact which made the giving or receiving a rich exchange. I couldn't understand whites and where they got the right to spend money so lavishly. Of course, I knew God was white too, but no one could have made me believe that God was prejudiced. My grandmother had more money than all the po white trash. We owned the land and the houses, but each day Bailey and I were cautioned, waste not, won't not. Mama bought two bolts of cloth each year for winter and summer clothes. She made my school dresses, underslips, bloomers, handkerchiefs, Bailey shirts and shorts, her aprons, house dresses and waist from the rolls from the rolls shipped to stamps by Sears and Roebuck. Uncle Willie was the only person in the family who wore ready to wear clothes all the time. Each day he wore fresh white shirts, flower suspenders, and his special shoes cost twenty dollars. I thought Uncle Willie was sinfully vain, especially when I had to iron seven stiff starch shirts and not leave a cat's face anywhere. During the summer, we went barefoot except on Sunday, and we learned to resole our own shoes when they gave out. As Mama used to say, the depression must have hit the white section of stamps with cyclonic impact, but it seeped into the black area slowly, like a thief with misgivings. The country had been in the throes of depression for two years before the Negroes and Stamps knew it. I think that everyone thought that the depression, like everything else, was for the white folks, and so it had nothing to do with them. Our people had lived off the land and counted on cotton picking and hoeing and chopping seasons to bring in cash that they needed to buy shoes, clothes, books, and light farm equipment. It was when the owners of cotton fields dropped the payment of ten cents of 10 cents for a pound of cotton to eight, then seven, then finally five, that the Negro community realized that the depression, the depression at least did not discriminate. Welfare agencies gave food to the poor families, black and white, gallons of lard, flour, salt, powdered eggs, powdered milk. So we're getting a little history lesson here. Um, I noticed that when we read Black Boy, he didn't really mention the depression, but I felt like hunger and struggle was like a common theme through his entire book. But anyway, um, I'm glad she's mentioning this. Gallons of lard, flour, salt, powdered eggs, and powdered milk. People stopped trying to raise hogs because it was too difficult to get slop rich enough to feed them. And no one had the money to buy mash or fish meal. Mama spent many nights figuring on our tablets slowly. She was trying to find a way to keep her business going, although her customers had no money. When she came to her conclusion, she said, Bailey, I want you to make me a nice, clear sign. Nice and neat. And sister, you can color it with your Crayolas. I wanted to say one five, about one five, pan, whoop, one five pound can of powdered milk is worth 50 cents in trade. One five pound can of powdered eggs is worth one dollar in trade. Ten number two cans of mackerel is worth one dollar in trade, and so on and so forth. Mama kept her store going. Our customers didn't even have to take their slated provisions home. They'd pick them up from the welfare center downtown and drop them off at the store. If they didn't want to exchange at the moment, 
they put it down in one of those big gravy, one of those big gray ledgers, the amount of credit that was coming to them. We were among the few Negro families not on relief, but Bailey and I were the only children in town proper that we knew of who ate the powdered eggs every day and drank the powdered milk. Our playmates' families exchanged their unwanted food for sugar, coal, spices, potted meat, Vienna sausage, peanut butter, soda crackers, toilet soap, and even laundry soap. What's toilet soap? The folks not use the toilet paper back then? Maybe they washed up every time. I remember that. We were always given enough to eat, but we both hated the lumpy milk and mushy eggs, and sometimes we'd stop off at the house of one of our poorer families to get some peanut butter and crackers. Stamps was as slow coming out of the, the Depression as it had been getting into it. World War II was well along before there was a noticeable change in the economy of that near-forgotten hamlet. Hello. One Christmas, we, re we received gifts from my mother and father who lived separately in a heaven called California, where we were told that they could have all the oranges they wanted to eat and the sun shone all the time. I was sure that, there, that this wasn't so. I couldn't believe that our mother would laugh and eat oranges in the sunshine without her children. Until, the, until that Christmas when we received our gifts, I had been confident that they were both dead. I could cry any time I wanted to by picturing my mother, and I didn't quite know what she looked like, lying in her coffin, her hair, which was black, was spread out on a tiny little white pillow, and her body was covered with a sheet, and the face was brown like a big O. And since I couldn't feel the features in, I printed M-O-T-H-E-R across the O, and tears would fall down my cheeks like warm milk. Then came that terrible Christmas with its awful presence, when our father, with the vanity I was to find typical, sent his photograph to us. My gift from mother was a tea set and a teapot and four cups and saucers and tiny spoons and a doll with blue eyes and rosy cheeks and yellow painted hair on her head. I didn't know what Bailey received, but after I opened my boxes, I went to the backyard behind the china berry tree. The day was cold and the air was clear as water. Frost was still on the bench, but I sat down and I cried. I looked up at Bailey, who was coming from the outhouse, wiping his eyes. He had been crying, too. I didn't know if he had also told himself that they were dead, but had been rudely awakened to the truth or whether he was just feeling lonely. The gifts opened the, gifts opened the door to question that neither of us wanted to ask. Why did they send us away? And what did we do so wrong? So wrong. Why at three or four years old did we have tags put on our arms to be sent by train alone from Long Beach, California to Stamps, Arkansas with only the porter to look after us? Besides, the porter got off in Arizona. Bailey sat down beside me and that time did not admonish me not to cry. So I wept and he sniffed a little, but we didn't talk until Mama called us back into the house. Mama stood in the front of that tree that we had decorated with silver ropes and pretty colored balls and said, You children is most ungrateful things I ever did see. You think your mama and papa went all to all the trouble to send you these nice play pretties to make you go out into the cold and cry? Neither of us said a word. Mama continued, Sister, I know you tenderhearted, but Bailey Jr., there is no reason for you to sit out there mewing like a piss of cat just because you got something from Vivian and Big Bailey. When we still didn't force ourselves to answer, she asked, you want me to tell Santa Claus to take those things back? A wretched feeling of being torn engulfed me. I wanted to scream, yes, tell him to take it back. But I didn't move and I didn't speak. Later, Bailey and I talked. He said if the things really did come from Mother, maybe it meant that she was getting ready to come and get us. Maybe... She had just been angry at something what we had 